Hello, everyone. Um, happy Monday to you guys. I'm recording this on Monday, um, but this is going to be your assignment for Tuesday. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, sitting up here at the Freshman Academy, it feels kind of lonely without you guys. Um, hope to get everybody back, um, hopefully on Monday. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and look at Chapter 8, Section 2, which is probably one of the um, biggest, let me move this over here so it's out of the way, um, probably the, one of the most important chapters we're actually going to cover here in Oklahoma History class. Okay, so um, in the first chapter, we kind of discussed the uh, beginnings of the Civil War and kind of what was going on in the territories at the time, kind of right before the Civil War. Okay, we also kind of led into um, the election of 1860 with Abraham Lincoln getting elected and um, kind of the eventual su succession of the southern states. Okay, so now we're going to focus on Chapter 8, Section 2, which is titled actually um, Indian Territory Joins the Confederacy. So I've kind of made known to you guys in class that Indian Territory actually does join the Confederacy um, in and around 1861. Okay, so the eventual um, loss of the Civil War by the Confederacy is actually going to weigh heavily in Indian Territory. Um, and this kind of eventually gets us into around the time of statehood. So the timeline here is around from 1860 up until around 1870, 1880, what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so the Territory. Okay, Confederate officials were well aware of the resources of the territory. We had mentioned in our class before um, that Oklahoma was chosen, President Oklahoma was chosen um, by the U.S. government because of its lack of resources and kind of its desolate view um, by our U.S. government. Okay, um, like we had talked about and we've had assignments over um, that this actually turned out not to be true. Okay, Oklahoma is actually a very fertile place and it's really easy to grow a lot of crops and to house a lot of cattle and different animals that um, you actually raise on farms. Okay, like I mentioned, abundant, abundant cattle, horses, grain and vegetation. Um, these were all very attractive to Confederate forces, especially Jefferson Davis, who was the president. Okay, we had an assignment over this the other day um, talking about how Jefferson Davis actually saw Oklahoma and the western parts of the Confederacy, in a sense, as kind of its breadbasket. So, um, in a sense, they wanted to conquer these areas that could grow um, crops and sustain animals so they could, in, in turn, feed the Confederacy and the Confederate Army. Okay, so starvation in the Confederate Army is actually going to come into play um, here quite a bit towards the end of the Civil War. Okay, Oklahoma's location helped buffer between north and south, central base um, west of the Mississippi. So this would have been a good push-off point um, for the Confederate troops. Okay, lots of major battles were actually fought towards the Mississippi River and also in northwest Arkansas. So this would have been a good place for um, the troops maybe to retreat to or to kind of house troops and be ready to fight along the western parts of the Civil War. Okay, um, Texas, um, this is kind of the biggest factor why Oklahoma actually becomes a Confederate state. Texas falls to the Confederacy, so um, they go ahead and side with the Confederate States of America in 1861. Um, and it actually, they start sending um, people up from Fort Towson in the areas of Texas all the way into Oklahoma, um, where the uh, five civilized tribes are actually located. And they start trying to uh, make treaties or agreements um, with the five civilized tribes that are actually here in Oklahoma. Okay, so um, in a nutshell, what we're at here um, is um, the Civil War starting in the east, okay, and both sides are trying to gain territory westward that would kind of create that boundary, and also they could house troops and eventually gain a little bit of land. Okay, moving on to the next one. Um, only three bases were manned by troops in Oklahoma during the war. Okay, here's a picture of Fort Washita. Okay, it was erected in 1842. Fort Washita was in the southeastern part of the state near Bryant County, which is kind of towards the town of Idabel and around Broken Bow today. Okay, so it was a pretty important fort at the time. Um, what happened? Um, so once the Confederates strike deals with the uh, Native American tribes, um, Fort Washita and eventually Fort Arbuckle and Fort Gibson were also um, kind of withdrawn from. So eventually they actually fall into Confederate hands. Okay, so the Union realizes that um, they have a small amount of troops left at these um, forts. So they kind of advise them to kind of just make their way north and hopefully join back up with the main parts of the army. Okay, um, Fort Arbuckle and Fort Cobb were both other uh, bases and also Fort Gibson. Um, these are kind of minor forts. Um, Fort Gibson kind of is a major uh, for an Oklahoma ministry. Um, the future withdrawal of federal troops led the tribes fending for themselves. Okay, so this is an idea um, that maybe the the, the um, five civilized tribes actually didn't want to actually side with the Confederates. Um, even though that most of the five civilized tribes people actually did own slaves, the well-to-do Native Americans did, um, 
maybe this was a reason also they sided with Confederacy is they kind of had no other option in a sense because the Union Army kind of left them to defend for themselves and the Confederate Army had a lot of troops and a lot of power and maybe they were scared. And so instead of fighting the Confederates on their own and maybe hoping for the Union forces to join them, um, they went ahead and just went ahead and like I mentioned, they um, sided with the Confederacy. Okay, so this is where Oklahoma eventually becomes a Confederate state or a slave state in a sense. Okay, moving on. Um, so this is a picture of John Ross. We've talked about John Ross um, quite a bit in my class when we're talking about Cherokee removal. Okay, if we remember about John Ross, um, he was of English or Scottish and Cherokee descent, so he actually was fluent in both languages. Okay, this was very um, difficult at this time to find somebody that was um, able to do both in a sense. Okay, so this made him very powerful and also very well known um, throughout the United States. Okay, he went to Washington um, along with uh, Major Ridge we talked about um, in our class. And John Ross was a big proponent of the Cherokees trying to stay on their land. And if you remember Major Ridge, um, Elias Boudino and John Ridge, I think it was John, I'll have to remember his son's name. But they're the people who actually make up the treaty party who go behind John Ross's back and eventually move the um, Cherokees into present day Oklahoma. Okay, the natives either had to join the Confederacy or fight on their own, like I mentioned earlier. They really had no other option, meaning um, if they weren't going to join the Confederacy, the Confederates wanted their land and their resources and their manpower, so they were going to have to fight them if they did not want to join the Confederacy. So they eventually um, opted to join forces instead of um, coercing a battle with one another. Okay, Confederate officials actually met John Ross. Um, you can actually go and see um, Park Hill, which is a suburb of Tahlequah towards the um, southeast part of town towards Keys. Um, you can actually go see the, the Ross Mansion um, where the Confederate officials actually did meet John Ross and tried to coerce the Cherokee Nation into joining the Confederacy. Um, the Confederacy first off signed agreements with the Creek, Choctaw, and Chickasaw. So there's three of the major tribes. Okay, So once they signed deals with them, John Ross kind of sees that Indian territory is going to fall for the Confederacy, even though John Ross does not agree with the Confederate right to bear arms and their succession. Okay, John Ross actually has a few sons um, that fight for the Union Army during the war. Okay, so he's kind of split in two. But he also sees there's a guy by the name of Stan Wadey, who we're going to talk about, who is a major uh, player in Cherokee times at this time in history. Um, that is has a lot of support and also is very willing to join the Confederacy and eventually does and becomes a major general in the Confederate Army. Okay, they eventually the Seminole, Osage, and Wichita um, so, signed treaties as well with the um, Confederate states. Um, the Cherokees being alone, so they were kind of the last one to join the Confederacy, but they eventually do um, join the Confederacy. Okay, moving on. Um, we're going to talk about a guy by the name of Apophile Yehola. Yeah, I know that's a lot to say. <laughs> this is kind of a picture of what the uh, Creek chief looked like. Okay, so Apophile Yehola plays a big role in kind of one of the more sad parts in Indian territory of the Civil War. Okay, he was a Creek chief and led a band of the um, Creeks called the Loyal Creeks, meaning they were loyal to the Union Army. Okay, Apophile Yehola led the only loyal group to the Union, which divided the Creeks. Okay, the Creeks were a divided tribe. Um, a lot of them were in favor, especially if you guys remember the Creeks actually have the most amount of um, African-American slaves. So they are big proponents of joining the Confederate States because they would in tune get to keep their slaves. But Apophile Yehola sees this as a wrong thing and eventually tries to write President Lincoln um, once he splits with, his, with the lower Creeks. Um, and um, he eventually has to leave the Creek land within because he's in danger of the other Creeks trying to kill him and eventually take his people. Okay, like I mentioned, he appealed to Lincoln for help. Never, nevertheless, a battle between the Confederates and the Loyal Creek ensued near Tulsa. There's actually three battles. Um, we're going to watch an Ed Puzzle tomorrow over a Poth Leahola. And, um, excuse me one second. We're going to talk about these three battles, like I'd mentioned, and um, some of them were around present day Yale, Oklahoma, which is on your way to Stillwater on Old Highway 51. Um, one was around uh, the Tulsa area, which was known as Chusto Tulsa. Tulsa, Tulsa kind of sounds the same thing. You guys know Tulsa was a creek um, settlement and also um, one near Hominy, Oklahoma, the Hominy Hills area. Hominy's towards Cleveland and kind of on your way out on Highway 412, okay? 
Um, like I mentioned, he wrote Lincoln and he didn't really expect Lincoln to write back to him, but Lincoln eventually does and tells him to try to make it to a military fort, um, in Kansas. Okay. So what happens is he's trying to flee along with a lot of his people to Kansas and the Confederacy and the Creeks do not want him to do that. So they eventually start chasing Apothle Yehola and his people. Okay. They eventually run him down in three areas. Remember we talked about it just a second ago and they start trying to, uh, kill the children, kill the women, kill the men, anybody they can find that's a part of the Pothle Yeholah's tribe, they're going to try to kill. Okay, So um, numerous Confederate generals tried to track them down, and eventually Stan Wadey, who is, a, like I mentioned, a prominent Cherokee and a major force in the Confederate Army, um, they eventually track them down um, near Hominy Hills, and they actually kill a lot of his um, supporters. So what happens is the Creeks eventually catch up and the Confederates catch up to the Pothle Yehola, kill a lot of his warriors and also his people. And they're left without their horses, supplies, and adequate clothing to move north into, Can or into Kansas, um, which actually was experiencing a blizzard at the time. So his people had to walk hundreds of miles without adequate clothing, food, shelter. So a lot of them actually did freeze to death or died of starvation on their way to Kansas where the Union Army could support them. So it's a pretty sad thing, but it's um, also... Kind of interesting to know that the second battle, uh, Chusto Tolasso, actually took place around um, the Mohawk Park area of Tulsa, they think. There's some debate into that, but um, pretty sad story about Apothle Ehola. Okay, um, after the defeat of Pea Ridge, which is a major battle in northwest Arkansas, um, the Union troops take over Fort Gibson and Tahlequah, and then this is where we get to um, kind of the Honey Springs battle. Okay, a Confederate plan of joining troops near Fort Gibson resulted in battle. Okay, the Confederates after Pea Ridge wanted to kind of um, get back with their troops and eventually make a push into Indian territory. Fort Gibson, like we had talked about, was a big supply outpost, and it was at the mouth of the Three Forks areas, which is the Arkansas, Vergas, and Grand River. Okay, um, it engulfed a battle between numerous Indian groups. Actually, every um, person who fought either was on the Confederate or the Union, but also a member of the Five Supplies tribes. Okay, and also um, Buffalo Soldiers, which were the African American soldiers of the Kansas Infantry Division, actually fought in this um, as well. So you had African American representation, Native American, and also just plain American. Okay, and um, Honey Springs was the biggest Civil War battle in Oklahoma. It took near it took place near the town of Fort Gibson, kind of on the outskirts of Fort Gibson. Um, but it was a pretty decisive Union battle. Union eventually wins the war, devastating Indian territory, and eventually taking Indian territory from the Confederacy. Okay, so it looks like that is it. So go ahead and finish this Ed puzzle. Um, let me put this here. You guys should be good. Have a good day.